Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's SANS webcast, SOC Capabilities and Usefulness, Part 2 of the SANS SOC Survey Results webcast, sponsored by Authentic8, Awake, Cyberbit, DF Labs, ExtraHop, and Logarithm. My name is Carol Auth of the SANS Institute. Today's featured speakers are Christopher Crowley, SANS Principal Instructor, Gary Gallum from Awake, Latel Grossman from Cyberbit, John Moran from DF Labs, and John Pescatori, SANS Director of Emerging Security Trends, who will be moderating this webcast. If during the webcast you have any questions for our presenters, please enter them into the questions window located on the GoToWebinar interface at any time. Please note that this webcast is being recorded and a copy of the slides and recording of this webcast will be available for viewing later today and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to hand the webcast over to Chris. Thank you very much, Carol. I appreciate that. Um, thank you to everybody who's uh, tuned in. I'm talking today about the uh, SOC survey. This is the uh, second one that we've done. We did one last year. Um, this is part two of the webcast. I'd encourage you to go back and listen to the first part if you haven't uh, seen it already or listened to it. Uh, I would also encourage you to download the paper and read through it. Uh, some great insight and some details and some thoughts that I won't have enough time to go into today, uh, but uh, are there for you written down so that you can read them at your uh, convenience. Uh, I want to thank Latal, John, and Gary um, for um, being part of the webcast today. And sincere thanks to John Pescatori, who um, helped substantially with the paper and um, provided some great vision. Uh, John has been an analyst for um, an extended period of time and uh, is really a valuable uh, member of this team. Um, today, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, some, some concepts, but the things that I have previously addressed and will not recover include some of the demographics, uh, number of people in the SOC, some outsourcing aspects of it, a little bit about tools and technologies, but I also have some things about tools and technologies today in terms of um, what people think and satisfaction, some of the idea of relationship between the SOX and NOX and then the integration. What I will talk about today is the difference between some of the SOX that self-identify as managed service providers, tools and technologies, likelihood to address IoT and non-traditional IT, uh, the idea of having uh, integration, the value of manual and automated actions, and then overall, what are some of the challenges that people are seeing? So let's uh, go ahead and get into it. One of the initial questions that we asked folks, and they had the opportunity to self-identify as a managed security service provider. This is an interesting thing. Um, one of the reasons why we included this question in the survey was in last year's, there were some strange looking numbers in terms of organizations and the size of the organization relative to the number of people that were within their SOC. And you can imagine as a, as a company, if all you do is provide managed security service, then you're going to have an outsized SOC compared to an organization relative to your size that is also developing you know, software or manufacturing something or running a bank. Um, so this was something that last year and looking through the data, we thought about some of the outliers and thought this might be a good way to help with the differentiation. But of course, in larger organizations, when you start to have a federated uh, grouping of entities, um, what may end up happening is instead of having a single SOC that everyone must use, um, you end up with a central SOC that constituents of the organization have the uh, opportunity to use. And so I also wanted to differentiate some of those aspects. So, so in this, we see that there are some people that consider um, that they themselves are a SOC that they are a managed security service provider and that they're exclusively delivering this capability to um, organizations which are not their own. And then we have the other group, the, uh, the 123 with 22% of the responses saying, look, we're um, 
a SOC, we're embedded inside of the company. We sell our service to the people inside of our company and the people inside of our company have the opportunity to choose not to use this service. And so this is, this is a model that um, you know, we're, we're seeing, but, but most of the people answering, 306, um, you know, a little over 50% said, look, we don't consider ourselves a managed security service provider. We're just the SOC. Okay. And, and this really flavors the approach that a, a, um, a SOC is going to take. If it's a requirement, if it's a mandate, if there's no funding transfer, if it's not seen as a, uh, you know, a customer service type relationship, uh, then you, on the one hand, you have a, hopefully a closer identity with um, the, um, the constituents that you're providing service to. On the other hand, there's also the opportunity to basically um, end up with a circumstance where you don't have the thorough understanding of the, uh, of the people that you're dealing with, and there's not really enough agency and agenda to be able to drive that uh, maturity forward. So uh, the organizations that self-identified as an external MSSP, so the idea is we're a managed security service provider, we're delivering um, resources to customers, um, and the idea of how large their customer base was, in other words, this is a SOC with many different um, customers, how big does that end up looking like for the SOC? when you look at the expanse of territory that they're actually defending. And, and, it's, and it's interesting, uh, um, and again, there was some flexibility in how the respondents were off, allowed to answer this question. It's either how many computers are you defending or how many people are you defending? Um, and the um, largest number was that they were actually defending um, more than 100,000 nodes. Now, there were actually still at the uh, at the higher end, you know, 50,000 to 100,000, 15,000 to 50,000. There's some pretty large um, entities that are out there that are kind of eyes in the sky type managed security service providers. Um, and then it's interesting, you know, you get to sort of the smaller end and you have um, not nearly as many, but still a reasonable number, which means to me, the way that I interpret this is that you have some boutique managed security service providers that are doing something that's either a niche type of uh, protection or something that they're actually um, um, trying to develop the uh, trying to develop the business case and be able to uh, to sell that. So um, when people ask me the question of what am I looking for in an MSSP? if this is the route that I'm choosing to go, my advice is typically to reflect on what you need. Do you need substantial customization? Do you need tremendous flexibility? Right? And if so, then you're probably looking for a managed security service provider that tends to be on the smaller side because they will likely, and this is a generalization, so some of the large um, companies can do this too, but they will likely be able to deliver more customization and flexibility. The downside, of course, is you don't get the maturity and you don't get the scope of visibility for the threat intelligence that the very large managed security service providers actually have. Um, in terms of the internal managed security service provider, and again, just to recap the differentiation because I'm using several different terms, um, the characterization here is you're a SOC, your primary customer is your internal company, right? But the way that your company has arranged this, you are providing a service, but still you consider yourself a security service provider and as much as you're um, getting paid for that resource and you have a, a portfolio of offerings that people within the company can pick and choose from. Um, and what's interesting about that is about 30% of um, these types of SOCs are in competition, essentially, with external parties. So if, if the customer internal to the company says, you know what, um, this internal SOC doesn't do what I need, they have the authority and the flexibility and the autonomy to go and buy services from an external managed security service provider in order to get um, their customization and tailoring. Um, personally, 
in many cases, and again, generalized across the entirety of businesses in the world, I actually like this. Um, some encouragement of uh, some encouragement of competition there, and the ability to say, "Look, our central sock doesn't do what we need it to do. It's chosen to offer a certain portfolio of capability, and it's not what we need right now. And so let's get that customization and tailoring." Okay. So my opinion, and if uh, I had more details on a specific circumstance, I might uh, change that opinion, but generalization across all things. And then the sizes for this, um, and this is broken out um, and for server endpoints versus non-server endpoints, the server endpoints being defined as um, the things that people can't log on to directly, but are offering some sort of a, a program in order to support um, the business versus um, non-server endpoints being your workstations, your um, mobile devices, and so on. Uh, and <clears throat> I, tr I was hoping to find some trend in this uh, data, and I said just I just really don't. Um, I I don't see that it's oh the internal managed security service providers are always when it's small or always when it's large. There's kind of a uh, there's kind of a hodgepodge of uh, of data across this, um, but it's an interesting uh, interesting idea that this happens at any size. Right. This is the uh, the notional aspect of what the organization is uh, is providing is that we can adopt this model um, as needed in terms of uh, basically delivering our capability. Right. Um, this is something that I think that you can see that people are trying to do it. Um, in my personal experience, I think that there's uh, you know a good path to maturity here. I don't know that everybody that's doing it this way, though, is actually mature. Uh, I want to move on to a concept of uh, tools and technology. Um, we asked a lot of different, um, we asked about a lot of different tools and technology. And we asked the question in a way that said, um, do you use this per, per, for prevention? Is this stopping the adversary? Um, within your environment um, from being able to accomplish things. And prevention and detection, um, I like some other terms as well, but they're, they're you know, institutionalized in our field. We use this concept. Um, prevention is we stop it. Detection is we notice that there's a problem, and then we have an opportunity to intervene um, in order to be able to make an intelligent decision saying, look, this might be a problem, this might be a problem, um, but um, do we want to stop it um, because we're afraid of having some sort of, uh, some sort of a business impact associated with this, okay? So um, comparing you and your organization and the portfolio of offerings from a technology perspective um, to your peers, I have, I have a couple of takeaways, and there, there, are, you know, some more details, and you can get into this uh, to this graphic further um, in the in the paper. But it seems like if you are like your peers, the things that you should be doing, right, the things that you should be doing, really, um, access protection um, and VPNs. Right? This is part of the portfolio of offering that it seems like everybody is is uh, deploying. Um, I don't want to necessarily get too um, deep into the question of does my SOC have to maintain and manage this um, at the moment? I'm happy to talk about that offline. If people have thoughts on it, you can use Twitter or whatever to uh, to start that conversation. My uh, my handle C Crow Montans all together. C the letter C R O W. M-O-N-T-A-N-C-E. If you have uh, thoughts or comments on that, uh, feel free to tweet them out and we can uh, continue that aspect of it. Um, in terms of uh, other things that it seems like everybody should be doing, um, monitoring uh, endpoints, monitoring uh, logs, aggregating that log content as well as monitoring it. Now, this may seem um, plain and obvious to you, that you'd be um, aggregating logs and monitoring them. However, <laughs> if you look at the numbers that responded, um, 
not everybody's doing that. N not every SOC is actually um, tasked with um, monitoring logs on the endpoint. Not every SOC is doing continuous monitoring for um, for change deviation. Okay. Now, I have my opinions about that, uh, but the idea here is that this is what most people said that they were doing. They're providing access con uh, protection. Uh, they're doing VPNs, they're aggregating logs, they're running a SIM to do correlation um, and enrichment within those logs, and they're looking at deviations from a um, presumed standard baseline um, and investigating when that happens. Um, and then, you know, to kind of go to the bottom of the list, uh, looking at some of the things that are less common that people identified that they're uh, that they're doing. And this is interesting. And of course, there's a whole a whole long list of things in the middle there that I, I think are worth um, worth reviewing, but it, just in terms of what uh, what we have time to, to talk about today. Not many people are doing deception. We asked it two different ways, um, deception technologies such as honeypotting and then deception technologies. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's something that people tend to absorb the term honeypot and mean something very specific by it and uh, we're trying to generalize away from that in the uh, in the survey um, people are not doing frequency analysis um, so this is something that i tend to think of as hunting uh, you can actually develop um, use cases in your sim in order to do uh, frequency analysis based uh, triggering but people aren't using statistical and analytical methods in order to uh, review um, large volumes of data to identify outliers for investigation. Um, people are not using artificial intelligence. They're not using machine learning. Um, and if you're doing that, if you as an organization are doing the things on this list and you're doing some of these things at the, at the lower um, frequency, you probably are more mature than your peers. Right, and and I'm identifying this, and and of course I am drawing an inference from it, and it's not a it's not a it's a data um, driven inference, but it's not something that I can show statistically because I don't I don't have the uh, the the richness in this in the um, data of the survey to show this, but the inference that I'm drawing is if you're doing all the other stuff plus you're implementing these other technologies, you probably are more mature than your peers because you are in a circumstance where your portfolio of technical capability is providing your analysts with additional ways to look at the data that you have available within your SOC. Okay? Um, and, and this um, inference is drawn from, a, again, an assumption on my part that you should be doing um, two things to look at your data. One is you should be developing alert-driven methodology to identify issues. The other is you should be hunting with a presumption that you do not have alerts that are telling you that there's a problem, but you are persistently looking at the data to say, what did I miss? That's what you're asking in this circumstance. Okay. And so these, uh, this sort of last set, a lot of those are um, less mature, less alert driven um, technologies and more along the lines of let me find something that's a weird outlier that I couldn't find in other ways. There's one thing in this, um, in this list at the bottom that is, I think, an outlier from the other ones. Um, and so I'll address it as well. It's the notion of e-discovery. Um, I, I talk about e-discovery when I talk about um, SOCs and building SOCs because um, I think that the e-discovery uh, tooling is essentially the same sort of tooling that we would use for identifying um, you know, malicious actors, for uh, identifying threats, but it's actually applied to a different thing that the business needs, which is when a legal request for information is sent to the business, there needs to be an efficient way to collect the data. And since we're doing this same sequence of behavior in a, um, in a detective and responsive way, um, this, this e-discovery becomes a, uh, a capability. Now, some organizations have a specialized capability inside of their general counsel that's accomplishing that. I think that's phenomenal. If 
I was in an organization or if I was consulting for an organization which had that, I would certainly not fight to bring it into the SOC, but I think that it's important for people who are developing SOCs or who, who have them to look at their own capability and think, can I do that if, if the organization was provided with a, uh, a legal request, say in the case of a wrongful dismissal case, uh, circumstance, can I go and gather the data that's relevant to that in an efficient, streamlined way, or am I going to have to uh, make it up as I go along because we haven't done that before? Um, and so, you know, again, I just suggest that again as a maturity point is if you've considered this possibility, if you've didn't, been down that path, um, then you'll be in a better position to serve the organization and all of its interests, not just, uh, you know, is there ransomware on my, uh, on my system or did I, I don't know, introduce a, a virus into my uh, organization when I was uh, intending to update things and didn't verify that the uh, the update tool that I was using was in fact infected, right? So, th so that sort of stuff is the, uh, you know, is the sort of bread and butter of the SOC, but as you start to get more um, portfolio of offerings, um, you cover additional things. Included in which is the notion of um, the IoT, the Internet of Things, IoT. So, IoT um, tends to be um, important and often neglected. And we're seeing here that um, people say, you know, right now, right now, um, we are partly supporting our smart systems. We had about 24% um, who said that they do it now. 13% um, roughly saying, hey, you know, we actually, um, handle monitoring for all of our smart systems. The 36% of the now um, is a little disappointing to me. Um, no, we have no plans to support smart systems. And I, I'll just go ahead and throw the other 8% of people that say we don't know. <laughs> right? um, and, and in fact, we haven't assessed um, and inventoried small smarts or, or smart systems yet, um, but we're going to do it. Um, to me is basically right now, no, you're not, uh, you're not supporting them um, and you're thinking about it so you don't have plans to do it. So you've identified a gap um, that you need to discover but are, you know, aren't addressing it. This is a problem to me. This is, uh, this is a space where we tend to have lower maturity, uh, fewer patches released, uh, more opportunities for abuse. And they're there because they're usually important systems for us to, uh, to look at. Um, Another question that um, comes up a lot for me when I'm talking to people, both in the in the Management 517 class that I teach, and you know, and working with uh, with customers, is dealing with the translation between IP address on the wire or IP address of an endpoint node that um, provides some data that's interesting to you, and the how do we find it, right? Who do I know? Is responsible for this asset. This is a, an ongoing challenge, and less than 10% of people were where I thought it would be. Um, you know, kind of interesting is uh, full integration, your badging system, your authentication system, your uh, your asset inventory. Right, basically every piece of uh, data that you have related to the people working and the tools in use in your organization, that you can look at an asset and for a given point in time say, I know who was on that asset, I know where that asset is, I know what that asset does, and I know who's responsible for that asset, and I know who I should talk to in the event that there is actually a, uh, a problem with that asset and I need to do some sort of, uh, some sort of remediation response investigation on it. Okay? So 10% of people, and I'm, I'm rounding up, 10% um, of, of the organization say, yeah, 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 we can do that. Um, and then we have, you know, sort of another group, which is, is probably as good as needed for most organizations is sort of this, um, you know, fully automated with your um, authentication system and, uh, and, and asset inventory and so on. Um, and, you know, kind of going up there, the mostly automated, sometimes we have to go back and find it, about 40% of people um, responding in that case. 
and a little less than half are saying, you know what, we, we kind of don't know, we have to go back, we've got a spreadsheet that helps us to correlate to that. This is, uh, this is uh, again, an indicator of maturity. This is an indicator of a drive to provide efficiency. This is the ability to, to run runbooks. This is having walked the path. This is having institutional support. Um, the, the people that are in that less than 10% uh, category, um, you know, it's, it's the kind of thing when I go, uh, you know, look at an organization sock and they can tell me that this is what they do. I'm just impressed by that. And uh, they usually have a lot of, uh, a lot of maturity in, in, in those circumstances. The folks that are complaining that every time they have to go figure it out and ask the question, stuff moves and they don't get, uh, they don't get notified. There's usually an institutional barrier um, that is preventing that information sharing that makes that sort of thing happen. Okay. Um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of the actions that people take, um, we asked a question around this is, do you like it? Are you, are you, are you confident that the thing that you're, uh, that you're doing um, and your capability to do it is satisfactory? And in this, um, in this chart, uh, you'll see that the sort of the dark blue bars versus the light blue bars are combined for the, uh, for the ranking. Um, this, is, this is something that I've looked at this data a few different ways. The way that I often look at it is I will actually do a ratio of very satisfied plus satisfied divided by the total, but it makes it, it paints a prettier picture if you if you uh, rank it this way um, in terms of uh, what what people are uh, thinking about. But just realize that there are a couple different ways to look at any of this data, and um, this one is is clear. Um, but uh, I also have another picture of it, uh, and it's it's worth kind of uh, thinking about that as well as how many people are actually responding on the individual line, and then the ratio there. Um, Basically, it's it's interesting, and I'm going to bop, you know, drop to the bottom um, to talk about problems, just kind of in the uh, in the interest of time. Um, but it's interesting that people are not very satisfied with their ability to do hardware reverse engineering. Actually, it's no surprise, is it? There's there's no surprise that uh, people are unsatisfied with that. Why? Because it's really hard. First of all, I don't know if any of you have done it, but it's a, a skill set that is rare. Um, it's error prone. Um, Oftentimes, the organization will actually prohibit you from even doing it. Um, people are unsatisfied with the notion of deception. Um, this is a, a, a growth space for socks. The idea of how do I use deception is something that people haven't figured out yet. Um, I personally really like this capability. I'm not talking about dropping a you know an unpatched Windows XP box out on the uh, the outside of your firewall and see how uh, how long it takes to get it compromised. Uh, that's pointless for me as a as a SOC. You know, security researchers and other people tracking that you know survivability time. I think it's a, a decent exercise, but it's not really what we care about. What I care about in deception technologies is the subtle and difficult to identify for an adversary asset that is a clear indicator for you when someone or something touches it. And if you start simple with this, and the kind of the canonical simple example is put a folder at the top level of a file server and work through the process of culling out false positives. And one day, one day in a report, your analysts are going to get, it's going to say, hey, somebody touched that folder. And some analyst is going to say, huh, you know what? That's weird. And that's going to start an investigation that'll lead to something. What are the, uh, what are the odds that that leads to something useful? Um, I'm not a betting person, but I'd say one in 10,000 or so. So you have to do some work in order to cull this stuff out. But once you get this sort of behavior nailed down, it's gold mine type value. Now, you have to sift through a lot of dirt to get to the gold, but when you get there, usually you are tapping into a vein that has some substantial value. Um, in terms of uh, challenges that people are seeing, uh, the challenges that people are seeing, number one, top of the list, most reported, lack of skilled staff. Now, I accept that. Uh, I, I do training for SANS. I, 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 see, I see people um, at various degrees of maturity. I understand it. 
I am going to tell you my opinion about what it takes to have skilled staff. Part of it is very effective hiring, and no surprise there, right? You're like, Chris, tell me something I don't know, right? The, the other part of this is a commitment to internal training. And I'm not just talking about sending people to SANS classes or sending people to Black Hat or sending people to B-sides. That's not what I'm talking about. That's external training, right? What I'm talking about is building a portfolio of tasks that you will ask your analysts to do on an ongoing basis, which are designed to do two things. Number one, increase the capability of that individual analyst. Number two is to make it so that Anything that that analyst knows is shared among the other analysts on the team. Now, there are some people who work in SOX who don't really like sharing. I get it. If you develop a program for having these sorts of challenges, then they will share. And part of what I want shared is not just the how do you run this tool. It is why does this matter to the business? And how can we make our business more effective and our SOC more aligned with that business? Okay, so this is uh, some of the stuff out of the SOC survey that I had some time to talk about. Uh, interesting stuff. I think there's some, some great insight that you can uh, derive from this. Um, I think that there are some challenges that remain in terms of our collection methodology, in terms of the, the data assessment. Um, I'm gonna, uh, start here in a moment, um, but I, I do also just want to, uh, you know, um, say uh, that I strongly encourage you to read the paper, and I would love to hear um, your thoughts, agree or disagree, on the things that I've said and the things in the paper. Okay, uh, so with that, I want to uh, go ahead and uh, turn things over to our, our next speaker, um, and uh, Lital uh, from Cyberbit, if you'd go ahead and uh, unmute and start talking. Great, thank you, Chris. Um, okay, so just maybe a, a very brief word about Cyberbit. We're a company uh, based headquartered in Israel. Uh, we've got 240 employees. We've got offices also in the US um, and in Europe and in APAC. Um, and um, we're a subsidiary of uh, Israel's largest defense company called Elbit Systems. Uh, and we've been around in the market for quite a long time. All of our um, doing has been uh, going on for over two decades now in cybersecurity, uh, previously within Elbit Systems and afterwards as Cyberbit. Uh, we've been around for three and a half years now as, a, as an independent subsidiary that supplies uh, cybersecurity solutions um, to uh, commercial entities all around the globe. So that was very briefly about us. And Chris, I'll be happy if you can click Thank you. Um, so the previous uh, slide that Chris showed was um, was about the challenges that people uh, stated that they have in their security operations centers, and um, the the first the top three challenges, as you saw it there. Um, I, what what I wanted to present is our offering to how to solve these three challenges. So number one, the lack of skilled staff. Um, as Christopher stated, this is uh, a challenge that we see all around, all around the globe um, in many, many security operations centers, big and small. Um, and this is a real challenge. We're talking about millions of unfilled jobs. Only, uh, I believe in the U United States, they're talking about over 200,000 unfilled uh, security jobs. And uh, it really is a challenge uh, how to, to make people better, how to train them better. And, um, and I will show our proposed solution to how to improve the training and increase the, the team impact and the sharing of knowledge that Chris stated between the different personnel. Um, another aspect of this is really simplifying and automating the SOC processes. So allowing uh, tier one analysts to have uh, broader capabilities than they have today by automating processes um, and, by, and by allowing them to more easily solve uh, solve complicated incidents. Um, so that's uh, how, how uh, we offer to address the lack of skilled staff. The second challenge stated in the SANS survey was lack of automation and orchestration. And here the solutions would be to automate recurring tasks, things that are very routine and can be automated and, and not be done manually. 
um, and introducing the, the SOAR technology, uh, that's security orchestration, automation, and response. Um, so this is basically a system that allows automating, orchestrating um, tasks around the SOC and providing a response all in a single pane of glass. Um, and the third challenge uh, stated was too many tools that are not integrated. And again, the solution here would be orchestrating uh, multiple tools in one single pane of glass. Uh, Chris, can you please click the, bot the button for me? Okay, so starting with the number one challenge, uh, lack of skilled staff. So um, the solution we want to offer is not just, as, as um, Christopher stated, not just training, also uh, allowing uh, the team and the staff to uh, collaborate information, to, to you know, work hands-on with each other, see how they would act in the real world. This is the, the concept of, of uh, training on a cyber uh, range simulated training. The way it works is that the range is a standalone environment that simulates networks uh, and threat scenarios. Um, and, and what you do is that you train the entire team hands-on as if they're sitting in their own shift inside their own security operations center. They have to follow their procedures and playbooks. Uh, they have to use the tools that they're using. And this is a great solution for, first of all, bringing the entire team to a higher level, uh, improving uh, personal skills, individual skills, um, and also allowing the team to learn how to work better together. Not just uh, improving the, the actual procedures in the organization, but also the way that the people cooperate and, uh, and share knowledge with, with each other. What you see here is a photo from, um, from uh, a university that installed our CyberBit range. Uh, generally, the way it works is that, that there's an instructor and then training classes, um, and, and the training is done in, in, a live, uh, in a live way. Everything is recorded. Trainees and teams can be evaluated. So this is a great solution for improving uh, the skill uh, shortage. Uh, can you please provide me another click? Thank you. Looking at the second challenge, lack of automation orchestration. So the solution for that would be a SOAR platform, security orchestration, automation, and response. And um, I, I bet you've heard this name before. Uh, it's not new talking about the concepts of automating and orchestrating the SOC, but I do want to add one thing here. Um, we think that uh, providing uh, good incident response on a, a good platform would contain not only the orchestration and automation, which um, a lot of people uh, tend to think that this is the main solution, but also considering the investigation. Investigation eventually is the task that takes the most time uh, inside the Security Operations Center. And if you allow the analysts to investigate as part of this central single pane of glass and you have all the information in one place and you just can support the entire process all the way from detection through investigation and to response, um, this is a, a great way of uh, minimizing the timeframes for response and uh, bringing the SOC into a higher level, uh, allowing it to respond in a more effective and, uh, and better way. Another click. Okay, challenge number three, too many not integrated tools. And again, the solution here would be using a security orchestration automation platform, uh, just integrating all of these tools together into a central pane of glass allows the analysts to be focused on uh, identifying and responding to the threat. They don't have to go and start um, operating all these different types of, uh, of response tools, of firewalls, IDSs, IPSs, uh, EDRs, whatever they're using. They don't have to search uh, for additional enrichment data uh, in other tools. They get everything concentrated in one place. All the information can be brought to them by automatic processes um, all through a central, a central SOAR system. Another click. Great. Uh, what I wanted to show here is um, is really the, the eventual result of integrating such a system into the Security Operations Center. What we see here um, is a case study of a, a real customer we have, which is a financial institution. And what they measured here is um, is uh, the number of incidents closed per shift. And also, if you read the actual uh, SAN survey, you can see this is the, the third metric um, used the number three widely used metric um, for measuring the SOC performance. Um, and you can see that uh, when before uh, SOC 3D was installed there, um, we ha they had less than 30% of the incidents resolved in one shift. Whereas after three quarters, that's even less than a year, they had 300% increase in the efficiency and 80% of incidents were closed in one shift. So this is really a major 
impact of uh, deploying such a system, understanding how to work with it, automating the processes, bringing the right information to the analysts um, while they're investigating. And, and you can see this is honestly a huge impact on the Security Operations Center. Another click. Now I want to relate a bit to the world of MSSPs, which uh, Christopher spoke about in the beginning. Um, so really, MSSPs face uh, other challenges. They have very unique challenges and unique um, orchestration needs, uh, again, because they deal with a lot of organizations. And you saw the numbers that uh, Chris presented. Uh, it can get uh, to being really a lot of things that you need to support. And because they support so many organizations, so they have very large um, alert volumes that flow in all the time, uh, which they need to prioritize. Uh, all the time continuously and be on top of things they have a lot of different playbooks okay because different organizations might need different um, processes <clears throat> to to respond to these threats they have to support multi-tenancy um, be transparent uh, they have to share information with their customers and sometimes also with regulation and of course provide SLA reporting so MSSPs really face other challenges and these challenges have to um, to be addressed by these systems so if you want to if you're an MSSP and you want to choose a SOAR system, you really have to make sure that it supports the, the unique needs of MSSPs, um, uh, have uh, dedicated dashboards, uh, designated KPIs. Um, so this is really an issue to address when, when you want to improve and be, become more efficient. And that eventually allows you to support more customers and increase the revenue. Another click. Okay, and to summarize, so we believe that incident response really must be addressed broadly, okay? You must have consolidated detection, response, automation, orchestration, and orchestration across the entire attack surface, which in many organizations, by the way, is not only focused only on IT. And also in the questionnaire, we saw that more and more organizations are, are going into protecting their OT and IoT assets. So this is a thing that you can't ignore as much more um, Internet of Things is going in and you know smart buildings and smart organizations. Um, um, you have to address these types of devices and have to monitor them just as you monitor your IT network. You have to make sure that all of this monitoring and detection capabilities uh, go into your SOC orchestration platform, um, allowing you to minimize the required time for, for response and, and leveraging your analysts' capabilities. Um, and you have to accompany all of that with, with training, okay? You have to make sure that your SOC is well-trained, the people know what they're doing, that helps you improve, improve your operations, uh, your metrics, uh, and your playbooks. So this is a really important factor as well. And we believe that only when these things all work together, um, this is the way to really, really get, you know, the best results in improving your operations and, and becoming more efficient. Um, so with that, Chris, if you can just click one last time, I want to thank you guys uh, and gals for your attention. Um, if you'd like to contact me, uh, I'm accessible in my email. That's lital, L-I-T-A-L, uh, dot Grossman, G-R-O-S-S-M-A-N, it's cyberbit.com. Uh, and of course, you're welcome to visit our site as well. Uh, so thank you all very much, and I'll be passing it back to Christopher. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Lital. Um, I want to invite John uh, Moran from DF Labs to uh, go ahead and uh, share his thoughts with us. Great. Thanks, Christopher, and thanks, everybody, for joining, and, and thank you for sharing the uh, that, that presentation with us. Uh, there was definitely some interesting findings out of that out of that SOC survey, and I think there's some some interesting challenges that we're facing today in, in both the SOCs and the MSSPs, and, and something that Inkman uh, from DF Labs is, is uniquely positioned to, uh, to help solve. So real quickly, uh, about uh, DF Labs and Inkman, uh, DF Labs is uh, a European-based company. We have offices in in uh, Italy, uh, in the UK, and we also have offices uh, here in the US, as well as a few uh, people scattered throughout APAC and uh, and uh, the Middle East. Um, so we were originally a um, a case management platform, uh, and when SOAR came about, we we pivoted and uh, started including some of that orchestration and automation capability. And we've really grown over the past five years to become a full-featured security orchestration, automation, and response platform. 
And that gives us kind of a unique ability to serve the market because we have not only the automation and the orchestration capabilities, but we also have a very strong management, uh, case management background, which allows us to, uh, to really kind of provide a, a solution across the entire incident response lifecycle. So we're not only focused on the investigation stage, but we're focused on uh, also doing containment and remediation and really managing that entire process, which is, which is often missing from, uh, from from a lot of organizations and can be very complicated, especially when you get into the MSSP space, which was previously discussed, has some has some unique challenges of scale. Uh, next slide, please. So what do we do at, at DF Labs and, and how do we solve problems? Well, we talked a lot uh, throughout the survey about that kind of lack of, of skilled staff. And, and one of the things that we try to do is act as a force multiplier for security teams. So Inkman is able to really help you provide context to security incidents, to help orchestrate response activities and, and automate actions. Uh, what we see as, as one of the challenges across the industry is the amount of time that analysts are spending on very repeatable, very predictable tasks, right? An alert comes in and there's often a very uh, very common set of, of tasks that we're gonna undertake. And when you have that skill shortage, um, you know, manpower and, and the hours they spend are, are very critical. So we wanna act as a force multiplier for security teams to, to allow your SOCs, to allow your MSSPs to do more with less. And, and through automation and orchestration, we can, we can achieve that. By doing that, we, we're really striving to decrease the time to detect and respond to security incidents. So when we're taking up analyst time with these manual repeatable tasks, uh, we're, what we're really doing is, is increasing the time to detect and, and more importantly, resolve security incidents. And, and that can lead to, to obviously increased, uh, hugely increased financial losses. So we're trying to decrease that time and, and reduce the resulting risk from security incidents by allowing SOCs to work smarter. And, and obviously, in addition to that, meet that kind of legal and regulatory compliance that we need to do, uh, especially with some of the new, new regulations that have come out. Um, in addition to the orchestration and automation, as I mentioned, we're really trying to provide that end-to-end -end incident response platform to allow SOCs and MSSPs to manage incidents, to store forensics artifacts, to track those indicators of compromise and threat intelligence, and be able to correlate those so that we can respond in, in a more informed and educated manner to, to future incidents. We want to help organizations detect those threats and detect those patterns earlier. And we want to provide, like I said, those, those actionable indicators and intelligence to users. Uh, security operations, and especially when you get into the MSSP space, it, it's very difficult sometimes to, to uh, measure actionable performance indicators, right? We, we need to measure very specific things, whether it's uh, time to detection or SLAs for uh, MSSPs, uh, it's very different than measuring other other aspects of business. And so we need to find uh, really unique and creative ways to, to measure performance. Um, next slide, please. So we take a three-pronged approach to this. Uh, we have our automation. Uh, which obviously uh, we achieve through things like runbooks, uh, intelligent workflows, and our bi-directional integrations with different security products. Uh, we also focus on orchestration, which is uh, taking those different products and, and allowing them to work together, allowing um, you know, information from one product to be enriched by another product and, and really orchestrating the, the entire uh, incident response process. And then our last pillar is measurement. Like I said, um, you know, being able to accurately measure your security program is, is incredibly important, whether that's through reporting SLAs, KPIs, or, or just simply threat intelligence. Uh, it's very important to be able to have accurate measurements so that you can respond appropriately and, uh, and assess your security program. Next slide, please. So this is a very high level overview of, of Ink Man, and obviously we don't have time to go through all of it today, but uh, you can see we, we take a number of inputs, whether it's uh, syslog or sim. Uh, we have an API as well as different web forms. Uh, we can ingest emails, and all of that can be taken in and it's, it's correlated. Uh, we pass it through our machine learning algorithm, which we'll talk about here in just a second. 
correlate that with threat intelligence and allow analysts to to then enrich that information, whether it's manually or or automatically through our uh, our runbooks and our playbooks, and and take action on that in in a more informed way. And you can see uh, we can even work with with ticketing systems to interface with um, say the IT groups or or other systems uh, to to really allow SOCs to kind of function at their at their most efficient. Next slide, please. So here we have an example of one of our playbooks, and um, this is is one way that we try to increase the efficiency as well as kind of pass on that knowledge transfer that we talked about. So a playbook in, in Inc. Man is, is kind of a more linear step-by-step -step process, and it allows organizations to kind of codify uh, those either written or, or just verbal processes that take place in the organization. Next slide, please. Uh, this is an example of one of our runbooks here, and this is where you actually achieve the, the real automation and the orchestration. This is uh, all done in a GUI-based editor, and it allows you to take all of your different tools, all of your actions from all of your different tools, and, and actually create intelligent workflows. This can all be done automatically. We see, uh, it's a little bit hard to see in this slide, but there's various enrichment actions. Uh, we can make both automated and uh, what we call user choice decisions, which allow a user to step in and actually make a decision before automation continues, gives you that kind of, um, you know, that control over the level of automation that you want to have, uh, while also allowing, uh, you know, a human to make a decision before you do things like uh, maybe containment and things like that. Um, and then later on in the runbook, we actually do move on to, to containment and notification. So it allows you to create that automation, that workflow process, and, and codify the processes that you're doing manually, uh, but really save the analyst time. Next slide, please. And finally, I just want to talk a little bit about what we call our automated responder knowledge. This is our machine learning component. And again, um, it, it serves to, um, you know, both kind of inform uh, junior analysts as well as make the process more efficient. Basically, what we're doing is we're going to look at uh, previous responses to incidents. So as we start to build up a knowledge base of uh, what playbooks and things have been used on, on previous incidents, Inkman will start to recommend actions. So it's, it's a time saver. It's a force multiplier. And it also helps those junior level staff by uh, automatically suggesting actions that have been taken on previous incidents and uh, and suggesting those for future incidents. This is all completely customizable, so the organization can choose the attributes that are maybe most important to them when they're choosing an action, and uh, and it will continue to learn uh, as as the system progresses. Uh, so with that, that's my last slide. I appreciate the time. Uh, you can certainly check us out at uh, dflabs.com, and I'll turn it back over to you, Chris. Great, thank you very much for that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and invite Gary Gollum um, from Awake Security to uh, talk about some of the uh, issues that he identified in the in the survey. All right, thanks, Chris. Uh, so I'm going to be talking like an auctioneer here to be, be, be about five minutes or under. So, um, hello everybody, and uh, again, Chris and and John and the other panelists. Um, so. Watching this study unfold was fascinating for me personally because at Awake, we actually spent our first year and a half uh, embedded in SOCs across different industries and, and different sizes, um, sometimes for weeks at a time, analyzing how and why analysts make decisions the way they do. And the findings were shocking in some cases, um, specifically the correlation between skills crisis uh, and, and the tools that are ultimately used um, by the SOC, those, those uh, correlations emerge in some interesting ways. So why don't we go ahead and advance here. Next slide. Or next slide. All right, there we go. Um, so, so we see statistics like this first one that came out of the report that we were talking about earlier. Um, and you know, intuitively, they're not surprising. But there's some really you know, deeper questions there that I think start to get interesting, which is you know, why does over one third of respondents understand less than half of the devices on their network? Or, or even you know, who uses those devices? Or, or actually, in about half of those cases, we see they don't, don't really understand it at all. Um, and I think this, this was something that Chris was speaking to in the slide that kind of focused on, on IoT um, and the findings there. So it's funny, but you know, a single IP address can have multiple devices in a single day or a single device can have multiple IPs. But 
what technology do these companies or do these socks actually have available or use to um, identify this constant influx of devices into the network um, and develop profiles uh, around their activity? Um, continuing on and building up here, we can do a click, right? Um, you know, and, and the, I think this next statistic begins to help answer that question, right? If, if this correlation, if the correlation we see here that again, Chris spoke to earlier, is mostly being done manually on the most audited device types that are in the enterprise in the first place, which are servers and user devices, then of, of course, how well can uh, anyone understand those systems? much less all the other types of devices that are not audited as closely, which brings us to the last point here. We can advance to, to the next one. Um, yeah, the, the skills crisis, uh, alive and well, but I think it's because, and we see this when we really start to unpack the, 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 you know, the problems that prevent these things from being done, um, the products that, and the, the technologies, the tools that these SOCs rely on are focused on point problems and not the reality of the workflows that they're supposed to fit into. So moving on to the next slide. You know, we, we, all, we know, we, we, we all know what needs to be done to address many of these issues, but we also know historically that, that this is much easier said than done, right? Um, understand what you have. We can go ahead and click and, and kind of advance here. Right? Understand what you have. Oh, that means you need systems that don't rely on the accuracy of asset inventory spreadsheets and, and things like that but rather require systems that are constantly tracking the devices or systems that you have in your network as they move around the network um, and really watching for new devices and, and know how to discern between a device that is moving around versus a new device coming into the network as they're added to the network in real time. And then of course, analyzing the behaviors of all these devices over long periods of time. Uh, looking uh, for attacker playbooks, we can go ahead and click uh, twice here. There we go. All right. Um, and we can do one more over, over attacker playbooks, right? But, but looking for attacker playbooks, right? Uh, gone are the days of Zeus, right? When you could just look for signatures of exploit kits or, or malware or really you know, almost any PDF that came from the internet. Um, so differentiating between legitimate and attacker behavior is becoming incredibly nuanced. So, of course, the skills crisis is being exacerbated, really, by reliance on technologies that are just not designed for this new era or new reality of threat, you know, threat behaviors. Um, and finally, last click on this slide, um, automate hunting and investigation. Right? This is not just some glossy kind of, you know, silly BS marketing uh, statement, and, and I can't underscore that enough. Threat detection used to be possible with signatures, and then it used to be possible with heuristics, and then anomaly detection, and, and maybe even for a short period of time with ML. But now what I call forensic detection is an absolute requirement. Um, and forensic detection shares a lot in common with automation. It, it deeply correlates very diverse analysis methods. Uh, exactly like human forensic, uh, human forensic investigators do, but in an automated way to tie these things together and make sense, uh, which, which ultimately brings us to the last slide. And, and you can go ahead and, and kind of click and just build up until you see the, the green triangle on the right hand side there uh, for sake of time. But ultimately what, you know, what we were just talking about there that is, is the, the backbone of Awake. Um, Awake is a system that integrates uh, and I think elegantly weaves together a diverse set of analysis methods um, in automated ways while also providing a very powerful and extensible query system for forensic automation. Um, and as I mentioned at the very beginning where you know, we had that, that, the good fortune of being able to spend such a long amount of time uh, investigating and research SOC realities is designed to compensate for the deepest gaps that do exist in, in the skills crisis today. Um, and so we can go ahead and, and advance to the closing slide there. So I do appreciate your time. Uh, and, and of course, you know, did, did this in a very abbreviated way. So if you have questions, please feel free to follow up with me. Um, and looking forward to, to speaking with people soon. 
All right. Well, thank you very much, Gary. Um, I really appreciate that. Uh, thanks for the uh, the auctioneer style uh, delivery. Um, and with this, um, I want to go ahead and um, turn it over to John Pescatori and um, John. All right. Thanks, Chris. And uh, we're just about at the end of our time period here, so we're not going to be able to work our way through the audience questions. We will get you those responses offline. If you are watching or listening to a recorded version of this and you have a question, send it to q at sans.org and we'll get you an answer. Chris asked me to do a little sum up, so let me sort of sum up what we learned from this survey and in, in our two webinars here. Um, like every other security survey, this one pointed out the major obstacles are lack of skills, lack of staff, lack of funding and lack of management support. And, and I think you could find cave scratchings where when the cave people were surveyed about why they couldn't keep the saber-toothed tigers out, they came up with lack of skills, lack of rocks, lack of sticks, lack of cave leader management support. Um, the reality is there's the survey pointed out there's a lot of SOC teams that aren't doing the things they need to do to get management commitment, to add the resources, to add, either add people or buy tools to act as force multipliers. Only 54% of the respondents had the security metrics coming out of their SOC needed to convince management for support. Only 54%, same number, treated their SOC as an MSSP that might have to compete for resources. Hard to get resources when you're not prepared to compete for resources. Only 30% were achieving SOC and NOC integration. That's free money if you can take advantage of tools, common tools and data that uh, your network operations center is collecting versus having to spend twice on security. Um, same, same in uh, other areas of uh, integration between tools and the like. Um, until you can get to the level where you've put some processes in place to do things the same way twice, you can't collect the data, can't integrate the data, can't develop the metrics to get the justification to invest in the tools that you've heard about on this webcast and the last one from vendors to help you meet those challenges of uh, keeping up with the threats and so on. But with that, we're right at, at the end of our uh, time period. So with that, I'll turn it over to Carol Alt for any uh, uh, final words. All right, well, thank you so much, Gary Littell. John, Chris, and John for your great presentation. And to Authentic8, Awake, Cyberbit, DF Labs, ExtraHop, and Logarithm for sponsoring this webcast, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. Our schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care. And we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.